Hi guys, welcome back to Hear Our Voices. Thank you for coming back this week to listen to the rest of Allie's story. Sit back, relax, get some popcorn, something to drink, and enjoy. And also, if I don't say it at the end, see you next time. Bye! Out of the system, so meaning when you come in, you cannot sign it back in, and you need to go back the path. Right. And And they put your stuff aside. Yeah. Yeah, and then sometimes you lose your things, or sometimes they end up throwing away, or they don't know where they place it, or it's always some kind of drama. So remember, I told you that um, they never provided me with a dresser. So I went and I took it upon myself to buy this little chest thing from. It was like a bench thing, even though it wasn't going to fix the problem. At least it was something, and yeah. I got that because I figured, okay, I get this, and then you know when I move, I can take it with me. And they did not allow me to bring it up to my room they said you're not allowed to buy furniture here I said well how many times have I what? asked you guys for a dresser <laughs> you know I've asked you guys numerous times that I need a dresser you guys are well aware of it you guys brought me this little thing that is not a dresser and when I bought this thing they put it in a storage room for me downstairs and when I moved they couldn't find it they lost my what? thing that I bought. yeah and I had been oh contacting them I had been emailing them I moved out in November and i had been contacting them I went over there um, several times um, they still could not locate it I emailed like three or four different workers I call them you can't get in contact with anybody when you call so you got to go over there when I've gone over there I said oh the worker's not here the supervisor's not here like it's like they're never there and none of them respond to my emails I'm like what's going on it's just a little thing it's not a big deal it's either give it back or somebody has to reimburse me right you know because I paid for that because they were the ones not doing their job not providing me with a basic dresser is all I was asking for they didn't provide one and I went and took it upon myself to buy something you know that's what you need to be you need to be proactive and then they wouldn't allow me they said no you can't bring that in and they put it in a storage closet somewhere and lost it or probably somebody stole it one of the I think somebody that, stole it yeah <laughs> one, of be the honest. Staff, one of the staff probably took it home like oh she's not gonna be needing this she'll forget like thinking that I'll forget about it but they need to pay me for it then they need to cover the charges for it exactly yeah that's crazy that is really crazy so with everything three years did they um at the time was their son in school and did they make you go close to the school that he was going at the time yeah I think that's probably why we were placed in that specific um residence that was in the upper west side because the school was like not very far away and okay. I think that that had something to do with it because they did mention that they did like to try to keep um, the people living in area that's close to the school so that the children don't have to change schools. So, yeah, yeah. so he was able to stay in his school um, and he remained there. And then after that, shortly, it became remote learning. Um, but yeah, he was in that. He stayed in his school. He didn't have to change. OK, so you said you left in November just passed. How yes. was the shelter experience? Because you was in it before the pandemic and after the pandemic. How was the experience of the shelter different or even the same? Um, the difference was that they weren't coming to our rooms as much to do the checks, but they wanted us to do like take pictures and like email it to them and do all this extra stuff. And I'm like, look, I don't have time for this. Like, this is not my job to take pictures. You know, this is like... They could easily just do that when we're not there, you know, if they were concerned about social distancing. But, you know, at the end of the day, like, I never felt completely comfortable with the room checks. Like, I I mean, I see, I know, you know, why they want to do it. They just want to make sure that everything is, um, that things aren't broken, this and that. I get it, that it's safe. But um, it's very intrusive. It's very, very intrusive. And so they weren't doing that as much. Um, What else was going on? I mean, I guess another difference was that, I think the food room at that point was open to everybody, even though, like, like I said, we had ongoing issues. Like sometimes they're like, oh, no, you're not supposed to go in there. And sometimes they didn't mind. And it was just ridiculous. Um, but, yeah, I think they had made that open to everybody to um, for everybody to get some of that food from in there. And um, I think that was really it. I mean, they did. I guess they did help the students who were going to do remote learning um, attain iPads from the Board of Ed. And so they did help a little bit in those ways, but um, for the most part, it was, there wasn't much of a change within like, within the place, just had to wear masks. Um, And I think sometimes we were doing, instead of doing the in-person meetings with your case manager, they would do like phone calls. Yeah. So um, your son was in school. 
how was how was it getting an iPad? How was the internet service there and things like that? So yeah, so this internet service was definitely a problem. Um, we were able to get the iPad, but unfortunately we always had spotty service, which made it difficult for him to really fully participate a lot of the time. Um, and um, unfortunately there was just nothing that could be done. They had mentioned something about um, having Wi-Fi for the building, they would get a different Wi-Fi or giving people the password and it never happened. So we, yeah, so we had an ongoing issue with that. Did he ever like, do you think he's on top of his learning or you think he's behind because of this situation? Or did you try to help him your best way to make sure he um, got the work together? So I did try to help him my best. I do feel like he was behind, but he is a very smart kid. So even though he fell behind a little bit, within the, the assignments and the classwork. Um, he's, he did well enough and he was able to pass his grades this year. So he is moving on, he, he moved on both times. So um, yeah, he had a, he did struggle with doing work that had to be done on the iPad and like in within Google Classroom or within like the programs that they were using for school. Yeah. But um, he still was able to um, do well enough to, to pass his grades. That's good, that's definitely good. Um, do you have any like last words that you could share with people or any insight that you would like to give to people about this whole process that you and your family gone through and tell us like how did you end up getting to the apartment that you are in now also okay um so at the last minute I was um asked to fill out some paperwork for this um development where I am now and at first I didn't even, I was basically still up in the air because I was, as far as I knew, I was supposed to have some sort of voucher, but the voucher was like for 13, like 1300 and I think $5. So yeah. I was, I was like, I was sort of, I was looking, but just to do it because I knew I wasn't going to find anything. So I was just doing it just to do my part, you know, just to show face, like, <laughs> Cause they are like, they want you to look, they're like, well, look for apartments. And I'm like, okay, I mean, I'll do it. I'll entertain this. But it's like, I know I'm not <laughs> going to find anything like, hello, this is not $1,300 is not enough. And the, and the thing about that is that if you had some sort of voucher, you couldn't even pay the difference. Right. Like, let's say if I found a place that was $2,000, I wouldn't have been able to pay that extra um, 700. They wouldn't have let me, you know, do that. Right. It was so I'm just like, well, how how are people how are people moving out of here then? You know, if if these vouchers aren't enough and then they can't even pay the difference. Mm -hmm. So I don't understand how people were leaving with those vouchers. Um, and then there's also a lot of confusion about how long they last or how many years or um, whether you have to keep on signing up for them or not. Like there's just all this confusion. So at the last minute somehow I don't know how miraculously through, through the grace of God I actually was able to sign up for section eight and okay. I actually got in and I actually got into section eight and then when I signed up to this apartment I actually got chosen for the lottery for the apartment and I got the apartment so it just was all through the grace of God because Ooh. it looked like like it looked like I didn't know what was going to happen like I wasn't going to be able to afford anything because even though we had some money at the point at the time saved up we couldn't have pay any differences with the voucher that they were trying to give us at that time. Right. You know, so I'm just like, how am I supposed to do this? Doesn't make any sense. I was almost willing to get into a tiny little cramped studio because that would have been the only thing I could have afforded. Um, you know, but even that, I'm just like, well, what's the point, you know, to get here just to be like, okay, well, I need to move out into a two bedroom. Like, you know what I mean? Like when was yeah. that going to happen? You know, I was just going to basically go into a place that was the same exact size and, and yeah, sure, I would have had a little more freedom, but I would have been cramped, you know, it's like, it just, so I really didn't know what I was going to do at that point until, you know, miraculously, we were able to get section A, we were able to get in here, and and actually right before we were supposed to get into here, corona hit, and that kind of put some stuff on pause, and so we had to wait a lot, and then finally in November of 2020, we were able to move, but um, I think that we were supposed to go since March, because the same person who came with me to their um, appointment to do paperwork moved in March. And then for some reason, um, and I think I know why, because one day I was supposed to send the lady some information and she said that she never got it, that she lost it. And then when I sent her something um, last minute, then she goes, oh, I'm not in the office. Everything's shutting down, um, this and that. And it's just like, what? Like, you know, <laughs> and then that was it. And then I had to wait all the way to November 
but yeah, it was, it was literally through the grace of God that I, that I actually was able to get section A and get, um, this apartment. And it just, because, because none of it, it, it was not like something that was looking like, you know, I, there was a totally different path they were trying to send me on. And yeah. then all of a sudden, all of a sudden everything changed and they're like, Oh, here, just sign up for this. Even though the lottery was already closed, they still, um, they still, I guess they were taking extra applicants. They, they got, they t- took my application and then I think like a few days later I went to section eight and then I was accepted for that and it's just like it just all worked out thank god and and now we've been here since uh so and then the moving the actual moving was a whole nother nightmare too <laughs> because <laughs> tell me yeah, about it so so when we um when like they asked me to come see the actually somebody emails me out of nowhere like oh here can you sign this lease I'm like wait a minute I haven't even <laughs> seen an apartment like you're sending me a lease I have not even been invited to come view any units or anything and they're like oh really sorry we didn't know we were unaware I'm like what like how are you unaware like you guys should know right <laughs> right and so I got I got invited to come see the viewing and I believe it was on a Wednesday let's say and then I went to see it I was like okay great I signed it they wanted me to sign everything right away like that same day I signed the lease and then the shelter wanted me to move on on Thursday the very next day yeah they don't play <laughs> I'm like I'm like, wait a minute. Hello. I'm not even like some of my stuff was packed because I knew that I was like waiting to move, but like not every, not for me to be able to move in the very next day. Like, no, like, obviously not. Like I wasn't going to be ready the next day. So they're like, so they scheduled the movers and then they told them, you know, I need a certain amount of space because I have other things. When I got downstairs, there was another woman moving at the same day on the same day and they yeah. had all her stuff in the truck. So obviously all my stuff didn't fit. So then they had to reschedule me. So then they rescheduled me like for the next day. And then again, they moved me with another person and it's like, hello, I need my own truck. Like I have, you know, my stuff and this and that. And, um, and so that was a whole nightmare because instead of them trying to just wait, you know, at least to the end of the week or at least till Monday, you know, because I would have had that weekend. They yeah. were trying to rush it. And then, mind you, we're not ready. And then even one of the workers from the moving company came up to see and he saw that not everything was packed. And he's like, well, she's not even ready. And then they kept scheduling it, you know, for the next, yeah. the very next day. And it's just like, hello, can you please give me time? Nobody's helping you. It's not like they come to help you to pack. You have to do everything on your own. Mind you, I have fibromyalgia syndrome. And that was very difficult for me to have to do everything on my own. I had to drag the bags downstairs on my own. At one point, only one elevator in the building was working, which was an ongoing issue where the elevators work a lot of the time. It was an 18 floor building, 18 stories. Oh, wow. We had two elevators that were for, for the residents. And then there was a staff elevator, but the staff would always use the residents elevators as well. So they of were course. always full. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of the time, only one elevator would work. There were a few times where no elevators were working, even what? supposedly even, yeah, supposedly even the other elevator wasn't even working at times. Um, so that night, you know, of course, cause my luck, you know, I can't have it all that good. So, so when I had to move my stuff, only one elevator was working and, um, you know, I'm up and down, up and down. I lived on the 14th floor, you know, bringing my things down, dragging my things down in plastic bags, um, and um you know and it was just a whole nightmare and we also because we had storage but that was a whole nother issue with the storage thing um we would never received a um like a furniture allowance a furniture grant yeah yeah we never got that you should have went back to them because they say the same thing to me i went mm-hmm. back to hra n- numerous times and they finally they didn't give me the full amount but for me and my daughter's mm-hmm. like 1200 you're supposed to get i don't get uh-huh. the half of it 600 I said, mm-hmm. I'll take what I can get. <laughs> and I went okay. to the charities and I think Canva to get oh, other money okay. and stuff for my apartment. Oh, that's because really nice. So was there a reason that they told you? Was it the same thing? Like, because you had storage or something? I had like storage. That? Yeah, that's what they told yeah. me. And I'm like, well, it doesn't you. matter. I had to yeah. give a letter saying I don't have a bed. I had to get a letter from the um, storage place saying I don't have a bed in there and things like for them to want to give me money for furniture. I'm like, this yeah, we didn't shelter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we didn't we didn't have any furniture obviously because our furniture was destroyed when the leak happened. Um and even like when we um cuz we had moved our storage from one storage to another because that one storage was doing a whole scam. They yeah. would they would fill up the they filled up the box. Mind you, I wasn't there when they removed the stuff because I wasn't living in the apartment. They re- they would fill the boxes like tall boxes halfway. 
And then instead of putting the storage stuff in their facility, they actually put it in a whole nother facility, but then they put it under their personal names and they were charging HRA about $800 a month. When oh, mind wow. you, it was only worth like maybe half of it. And, and the boxes, like I said, they were only halfway full. They filled them halfway so that it could take up more volume, but it was tall boxes. And a lot of the stuff they took was like completely destroyed. It was stuff that was in the room destroyed. I'm like, can't you tell this is garbage? Like nobody was able to call me like to see that, like, obviously this stuff is not. So, so it was a whole scam. So because of them, because of that, that, um, that storage company, um, doing their scams that they do. And HRI is well aware because I told them several times and I, and they, and they heard things like that in the past. And I don't know why they still work with that company if they still do now, but, um, yeah, they knew. And so they knew about all that was going on. They knew that I didn't have like um, beds and stuff because you knew the reason I was in shelter was because my room was destroyed. So yeah, we still, I did go back to um, HR a few times. I guess I can still go a few more times, but I've already tried a couple of times, a few times to do the storage grant. And um, they don't really say anything. They just deny me, but they're not saying why. They're not saying like- You went for storage or you go for um, furniture? I went for, I went for, no, I went for a furniture grant that's crazy mm -hmm. when i do it i tell them what i like when i did it because i had to go back like i think two or three times and mm -hmm. i had to get them a letter from the st um, storage but now it shouldn't even matter because it's, you know that's november you just say you need you need furniture i'm yeah. definitely from shelter from this time i still can't afford especially with corona mm -hmm. um yeah. i need these things and they should hopefully give you but also other yeah. um places other like cat like um how, what do you call it home bases they give out money okay. for those things so if you google the one near you or three okay. want it they'll definitely yeah. help you get those i've heard i've heard about um home base because i was like um i was like a little bit interacting with them too at some point during the during my bedroom ceiling collapse situation yeah so i'll just try it again because um i've tried a few times and i never um i still don't have a bed for my bedroom so i'm not even sleeping in there you know yeah and um yeah so i'm just like right now I've, I've got a sofa with a sofa bed in it because i didn't want to get like just like some cheap whatever quickie bed just like for yeah. now and then, and then when i find what i really want or can afford it then get it then because then it's like well what am i going to do with this other thing if i purchase it you know i don't like doing that like yeah purchasing things just out of like quick necessity but then you don't really intend on keeping them you know or you don't want to right. keep them or it's not really what you want like it's just a waste of money it's a waste of time and it and it adds to the pollution of the world. So I'm like, I'll just wait till I really have the bed that I want. I'm not going to just buy any bed and just throw it in there just for the sake of, of having a bed in there that is not really what I want. Right. Yeah. That's crazy. This this story was like a roller coaster from the yeah. ceiling to the path <laughs> to yeah. everything. It's really, it's just, I'm happy you got a place for you and your son. Yeah, thank that you. You guys can be relaxing. I hope everything else works out for you towards yeah. that. It's, it's amazing, you know? And yeah. to know that, you know that she, she got out and that everything is good now. Like, it's not as the way she would want it to be, I would say. But yeah. it's, better than being under the thumb of them watching you every minute and just being annoyed and being yeah afraid, to be honest yeah it's not right I think one main thing is like the staff who choose to work in shelters or in that kind of environment they really really need to um learn and assess um the situation really because I really don't know for sure what these people's experience is or their personal life experience but if you don't know how to deal with a person who's been through trauma that you're not in the right place. You're not doing the right job. Because right. the first thing you need to assume, if you're going to assume anything, is that these people have been through a lot of traumatic stuff within the past few months. And, and, and they, need, they need compassion and understanding. They don't need to be treated like prisoners. They don't need to be treated like criminals. You know, they're human beings who, who, who for whatever reason, ended up in, in a rough situation. And, you know, it doesn't even matter, you know, what, what has happened in the past. But they're not, you know, and I think that one of their biggest assumptions is that the people who end up in shelter is because they couldn't pay their rent, right. you know, or maybe that they were lazy. And it's like, first of all, you don't even know that a lot of the women, is, I feel like more of the people who are there are there for domestic violence issues. These are a lot of the single parents are running away from an abusive relationship. Right. You know, they've been through trauma and now they're going to go into a situation where they're treated like, like, like they're a criminal and like they're in prison. 
that's not right. That, that is not right at all. And a lot of these workers, they need to they need to start figuring these things out. They need some real like they need some real etiquette like classes on these situations because they don't know how to behave. They don't know how to act. They don't know how to talk to people. They are completely lacking basic um, you know, like empathy. skills and dealing, yeah. yeah, empathy and then skills and dealing with people who have dealt with trauma. I think that's the problem too. Um, they just take a job because oh, it's a paycheck. But yeah. No, at the end of the day, it's not like oh, I, yeah, construction worker. You have to really you're dealing with it's like materials. You're mm-hmm. dealing with people. Exactly. And people come with baggages, especially in this situation. They're coming with extra baggage because they're in this situation. They they don't want to be in. People don't go mm-hmm. all of a sudden like oh, I want to be homeless. That's like it's not a good thing yeah. to grow up to. You want to be like. With your kid, what do you want to be when you grow up? Mm-hmm. Homeless, great. I won the lottery and I'm, I'm there. Exactly. So they're there because something happened to them and that's why they brought to you. You know what I'm saying? So you need to really see it from their side. I'm not going to say everybody. Some people come with, you know, attitudes, but sometimes the reason why they're and like I'm, that is because of everything happening to them. Right. Nobody's helping them. And, and, I'm, and I'm going to say, yeah, it's true. They feel like nobody's there to help and that everybody's judging them as if they've done something wrong. But I'll tell you this there are some people within the system who are there because they know how to take advantage of a system and they have somewhere to go or they have property somewhere and they've figured out ways to hide it. I I know about that, that that is something that does happen. But the majority of the people who are there are there because they, they have gotten to the point where they cannot bear whatever the situation was anymore. Whether it was them struggling to pay their bills, their rent, whether it was them struggling to stay in a relationship that was abusive towards them or their family. You know, and it's not usually something like when you come in, when, you, when the people who are going into shelter, especially the domestic violence um, uh, families, this is not like something that just happened to them. You know, like they got punched right. once and they decided to leave. They've been most likely dealing with it for years before right. they finally got to the point where they're like, you know what, I need to leave. So this is not like little trauma that just, you know, was something quick that happened one time. This is usually something that has been, that they have been dealing with for years. And unfortunately, the children are the main ones who are suffering from this. And to see their families and their parents in a situation where they, they don't have control, that's not something that a child should be witnessing. A child should feel safe with their parents, feel safe in their home environment, and you know, and feel that people who are around are kind people who are willing to help when that's when that's their job to begin with, you know? Right. That's definitely true. That's so true. Mm-hmm. But do you have any last words that you would like to tell people? Um, no, I just, you know, I just hope that if there's anybody out there who is dealing with, you know, those kinds of struggles, that they can just find peace and find a way to escape bad situations, you know, and it, there's some people who are, who, who remain in something for that sole reason that they don't want to end up in a shelter. It's better to end up in a shelter now and get it over with. Then, then prolong the suffering and then still end up in a shelter again later like anyway you know yeah so definitely. some people yeah some people like try to wait things out and they they stay in situations just just because they want to avoid a shelter it's like look you might be making yourself suffer now and then still have to go to a shelter anyway so it's like you know what if, if you see like that's something that's probably gonna have to happen it's better to just get it out of the way now do it now and get your own home and get your own space and do not allow yourself to suffer in a situation that that you don't want to be in that isn't safe for you or your family right definitely true but guys i hope these stories inspire you to treat people better and to be more understanding and more empathetic Mm -hmm. i hope these stories really open your eyes of how the system has definitely failed a lot of people i hope it i hope these stories just just make you think a little bit and if you could help somebody out there or anybody who needs to get resources they can come to this podcast and really get things to help them make their life better so thank you so so much for what watching listening to hear our voices mm-hmm. come back next time to hear more stories and also get updates on different resources that they have out here in new york city and if you want to share your story and want to be an in, inspiration to the people you can definitely email us it'll be in the description box of this podcast and thank you guys um see you next time